There is this horrifying creature that lives on a tiny uninhabitable island in the southwest Pacific that lives underground and at night it will come out and eat anything from coconuts to fish to birds to pigs to people. And in today's top story we're going to learn about someone that accidentally wound up on this island totally stranded and came face to face with this nightmarish creature. But before I get into today's video, if you're a fan of the strange, dark and mysterious delivered in story format, then please do consider hitting that subscribe button. And without further ado, let's begin. Dr. Guy Garman, also known as Dr. Deep, was an avid scuba diver and in 2015, he decided he was going to put his scuba diving to the test and try to break the world record for the deepest recreational scuba dive. And at the time, the world record was 1,090 feet, set by a man named Ahmed Gaba in 2014. Guy's plan was to go down to 1,090 feet and then keep going to 1,200 feet and that would be his record set and mark. But in order to do that, you need to go to a dive site that goes down to 1,200 feet. But luckily, Guy did most of his scuba diving off the coast of St. Croix in the Caribbean. And that area was known for its incredibly deep dive spots. Now, when most people think of scuba diving in the Caribbean, they think of beautiful clear water and amazing coral reef and exotic fishes. And everyone's so happy and it's so great. And the water's so warm. And of St. Croix, that was true. But if you continue going off show about 200 feet you reach a drop off that's known as a wall and we're not talking about a gradual drop off we're talking about the sea floor going from flat to turn into a 45 degrees and going straight down two miles into a complete black abyss now the only people that are actually allowed to dive into the walls and are very experienced scuba divers with all the certifications but if you're a tourist and you come to the St. Croix you can still scuba dive off the coast where it is beautiful and shallow and warm and there's reefs and fishes but you're not allowed to swim out to the edge of the wall and people report getting out there and standing on the edge of the cliff looking into the water with their mask and not being prepared for how intimidating it is. I mean, you're standing on one side where behind you is like this tropical paradise and in front of you is this seamlessly endless void where we don't even know what's down there. I mean, we've only explored 10% of the ocean. These deep portions of the ocean we can't get down so we don't know what's down there. What we do know is that sometimes whales will dive down into these deeper sections of the water and scientists will be tracking their dive and when they come up again after only going down maybe one or two thousand feet they'll return with these massive bites taken out of them because apparently there are creatures just down there that we haven't discovered yet that are so big and so aggressive that a whale seems like a reasonable thing to go after for food and so imagine standing on the edge of the cliff looking out and being like what's down there well our boy guy decides i'm gonna find out what's down there and i'm gonna do my record set and die at the wall and so after a meticulous planning and hiring a support team that's gonna be there to help him do this dive he and his wife and his son fly to st croix and they get ready to do this dive. Guy had arranged for a line to be lowered right at the edge of the wall that was weighted down by an anchor that was going to go down all the way to 1300 feet and they would put a metal place card at the 1200 foot mark on the actual line so that when Guy went down he would reach that place card at 1200 feet that's the record setting mark. He would use a greased pin to mark the place card to indicate I made it, this is legitimate. And then he would go back up and that's how the dive was going to go. And so in the early morning of August 15th, 2015, Guy along with his big support team, they head out to the edge of the wall. Guy gets into the water along with his son, who's going to go down with him for his first 200 feet. And he looks up at the support boat and he gives him an okay. He's ready to start the dive. And then he and his son, give the signal that they're ready to go down and they start the descent into the void as they're sinking lower and lower and lower in the water getting darker and darker until it's completely totally pitch black they reach the 200 foot mark they come to a stop as was planned and guy's son kip would give his father a squeeze for a good look because he can't communicate and then kip would go back up and guy would be on his own and he continues down to the 1200 foot mark once guy was on his own a timer had started because it's very 
important to track how long he's been down at depth and his team was expecting him to be back up at the 350 mark in about 38 minutes from when his son left but 38 minutes came and went and he was not at the 350 foot mark but even though this is a big problem guy had a whole bunch of extra air canisters with him and so if you ran into any sort of problems you would be able to continue to breathe air and fix the problem before coming up it would just mean longer decompression stops along the way and since he was tethered to the guideline they knew he couldn't drift away and so they just had to wait and hope that he ran into some problem and that he would be able to fix it eventually and then he would be able to come back up again but he never did they couldn't really send a rescue mission down to get him because guy was going so deep he was the only one that was able to get down there no one else was qualified or would be able to do it or had the right equipment for it either he was totally on his own down there it would take three days before they were able to get the right equipment was able to pull this line up out of the water and attached at the end of it was guy and he was deceased he had drowned but the really scary thing about what happened to guy is when he went down into that abyss he had all these extra air canisters attached to him and so presumably he went down the line probably all the way down to the record breaking mark and then he got trapped somehow and as he's trapped on this line in total darkness surrounded by who knows what down there probably for several hours he just cycled through his backup air canisters wondering am i gonna run out of air and drown or am i gonna get attacked by some sort of animal down here there is this tiny little stream that winds its way through a forest in Yorkshire, England called the Bolton Stride. It's not very wide, you can jump over it and it doesn't appear to be very deep. It looks about a foot or two deep and it's not moving very fast but and that's all an illusion. There are signs up all over the place that says don't go near the Bolton Stride. It kills people because just beneath the surface of the seemingly tamed water body is a natural booby trap that has a 100% mortality rate meaning every single person has ever stepped foot into the Bolton Stride has died. In 1998, Barry and Lynn Collect were walking along the Bolton Stride on the second day of their honeymoon and all of a sudden a torrential downpour starts just raining down on them and the rocks that they were on suddenly got pretty slick and Lynn slips and falls into the stride. Barry being a good husband runs over to try to save her and he too falls into the stride. A man named Desmond Thomas was on the other side of the stride and he saw Barry as he was running for his wife and he saw him fall in and he watched Barry's face as he was looking at him as if he was going to stay afloat at the top. Desmond said it looked like someone came up and grabbed his leg and yanked him under the water and he didn't see him again. Lynn's body was found six days later in West Yorkshire and Barry's body was found over a month later 10 miles downstream. In another case in 2010 an eight-year-old boy named Aaron Page was playing by the Bolton Stride for his birthday. There's an area that's totally safe that's away from the the stride where people have picnics and that kind of thing. He came down to the edge of the street and was running on the rocks and he slipped and fell in. Now an adult saw this happen and they ran over and they were able to grab onto him while he was in the water but the pull from inside the water was so strong that this person couldn't hold on to this child who was eventually sucked under and dragged away and drowned and Beyond these two reports, there's dozens of other people trying to jump over the stride and falling in and drowning. On June 1st, 1937, Amelia Earthhoff took off from Oakland, California on eastbound flight around the world. It was a second attempt to become the first pilot to circumnavigate the globe. She, along with a flight navigator, Fred Noonan, flew to Miami and then down to South America across the Atlantic to Africa and then to east to India and Southeast Asia. The pair reached Leui and New Guinea on June 29th. A couple of days later on July 2nd, Ethar and Newman would depart Lee and they would make their way to a tiny Howland Island, which is their next refueling stop. But they would never arrive. What Ethar was trying to accomplish at the time was such a big deal. And so when they disappeared, it was heartbreaking and it made international headlines. And this huge search is launched for them, but they can't find them. And after two weeks, they officially declared they were lost at sea and most likely dead. Three years later, and 350 miles away from Howland Island, which is the island Ethar and Noonan 
were trying to get to before they vanished. A British scientist was on this tiny little uninhabited island called Ninku Marero and they made a startling discovery. He found an incomplete skeleton next to what looked like the remains of a campfire and the skeleton was kind of torn all over the place like they had just been ripped limb from limb because Ninku Marero proximity to Howland. Everyone speculated that this has got to be the body of either Amelia Earthheart or Noonan. The bones were sent to two doctors in Fiji. They unfortunately said no, this isn't Earthheart or Noonan, this is somebody else. So those bones were ultimately disposed of because no one could claim them or no one knew who they were. And everyone just kind of forgot about it until 2017, when a forensic anthropologist decided to manually re-examine the measurements of the bones that were taken off Ninku Mororo Island and compared them to the real measurements of Amelia Earthheart and they discover that clearly those doctors in Fiji had made a mistake because the measurements of those bones match Amelia Earthheart almost exactly. So researchers go back to Ninku Mororo Island and they go to the area where these bones were found near the campfire and they look around and they find two bottles of 1930s era glass bottles and one of them is a freckle cream and Amelia Earthheart had a lot of freckles and she liked to use freckle cream to cover them up. She was kind of famous for doing that and so they found the freckle cream on this island near the bones that look like they belong to Amelia Earthheart. So while some scientists are putting their energy into confirming that yes those bones are Amelia's, we don't have the bones but we can show you with the measurements the freckle cream and there's another picture that apparently shows the landing gear of the plane. So there's some people that are working on that angle and there's another group of scientists and researchers that are saying okay let's just assume that really was Amelia Earthheart. Let's figure out what happened to her once she got into Nikumoro Island. And the leading theory is horrifying. Although Nikumoro Island is uninhabited by people, it is inhabited by one of the scariest creatures on the planet, the coconut crab. They are three feet long, they can carry at least six times their body weight and they use their pincers that are as strong as lion's jaws to rip open coconuts which is their main source of food. But coconuts are not the only thing they will eat. They'll also eat pigs, they'll eat each other and they're prolific climbers because they need to get up to the coconuts. But in some parts of the world they use their climbing abilities to climb up and grab birds and break their wings with their pincers and then drag them into their underground burrows where they will eat them. The few researchers and scientists that have gone to Nikumura Island have said at night thousands of these crabs will emerge from their underground burrows and they'll go looking for food and they have a really keen sense of smell and they can smell blood so when one of the crabs goes up and grabs a bird and starts ripping it apart the thousands of others will come charging over and swarm the bird because they'll smell the blood and they'll rip it to pieces and they'll all try to get in on the action and so the theory goes Earthheart and Newman are making their way to Howland Island and they wind up crash landing 350 miles away on Ninkumora Island on one of the reefs. Noonan probably dies on impact and Earthheart who's badly wounded and probably bleeding she gets onto the island and she makes her way up to the area where the campfire was found and for some amount of time Earthheart is able to survive off whatever she had on her and those glass balls but in a weakened state and bleeding at some point she probably attracted the coconut crabs who one night came out and swarmed her, ripped her to pieces and ate her. Today Ninku Moriero Island is only inhabited by those coconut crabs and it's protected land under the Republic of Kiribati and so if you want to go you have to get express permission from the Republic of Kiribati and they also send someone to go with you and obviously there's no airport on the island so you have to land on a separate island and then ride to the island on a boat but you have to pass through a cyclone alley which means you can only travel there at certain parts of the year and even then it's incredibly dangerous so that's gonna do it today guys please comment on what your favorite story is also please consider hitting that subscribe button as we're trying to hit 100 subscribers and yeah goodbye